there is this arms race between technology and behavior and then behavior is affected by technology. So technology jumps up and takes advantage of new practices and behaviors and expectations. And, and it just symbiotically keeps changing. Um, this body of work is one area where I've you know, been able to get involved with, with some interesting technology companies, some interesting B2B companies who have said, and getting back to our first conversation, how do we better allocate our resources? Welcome to the B2B Digital Marketer Podcast, a podcast helping you to end your struggle with digital marketing, helping you to pave a new and better path to target and capture your ideal customer. Each week, we teach you how insiders and experts debunk the dreary and become engines of innovation. Now, here's your host, Jim Rembach. Okay, B2B DM gang, man, I'm excited for this discussion that we're going to have today because I have Stephen Denny on the show. And uh, Stephen, you know, he's actually uh, more than just an internationally known speaker. Uh, he actually helps organizations to do some transformation in ways that not too many people get to. So I'm excited to have this discussion. And he's also the author of a book that was a best-selling book called Killing Giants, 10 Strategies to Topple the Goliath in Your Industry. And it's actually hailed as one of the top 10, 10 business books that you need to read. And he's now the author of Unfiltered Marketing, which takes all of that research that they had conducted to be able to create that book, you know, into this one. So it's an evolutionary process. We also have in the contention with the whole COVID changes of the world and a presidential election that has happened since then. So I'm looking forward to this discussion. Um, but he's worked with a very impressive roster of different organizations like Barco, Campbell Soup, Nuance, North Face, um, Jabra, GN, Resound. I mean, it, it goes on and on and on. OnStar, Sony. Uh, and for him, his passion is to really make a difference in the lives of others, uh, I, which just starts with his center of, of place being just south of Denver, Colorado. Stephen, thanks for joining us on the show today. Hey, my pleasure to be here, Jim. Thank you for, thank you for inviting me on. Well, I, I, you know, I, I have taken a lot of notes, but mm -hmm. I want to make sure that I'm following what our listeners uh, and watchers are familiar with. So I love to start with the question and ask, mm -hmm. what should B2B digital marketers be asking themselves right now? The single question, in my opinion, that B2B marketers need to be asking themselves right now is how do I change behaviors? And, and that this, is not, this is not the sexy uh, question to ask because we're living in this age of technology and, and platforms and enablement and all of this stuff. But truthfully, how do I change behaviors in my channels, my buyers, my people? It, it's a surprisingly complex question. Um, and, uh, the problem is it sounds so simple. How do I move a new pa a partner from zero to one? More importantly, how do I move a partner from one to a hundred faster with, you know, the, the right amount of effort. I'm not going to say no effort, a little effort. It always takes effort. And, and, and the problem is really that uh, in B2B marketing, it's so easy to kind of fall asleep and really kind of think this is all about making tools that are available when your partner needs them. That, that's anti up, that's table stakes. And as a B2B marketer, yeah, you, you need to have that. But unless you take that step and move from passive to active, you're not going to get there. And a lot of people miss this. So, you know, you, you're asking me a simple question. I'm giving you a complex ball of smoke here. But it's critically important. How do we change behaviors in a B2B setting? Well, I, I you know, it's interesting. Um, right before you and I started uh, coming onto this call and prepping for this interview, mm -hmm. I was having a similar type of conversation with somebody where they're, they're asking me questions in regards to marketing. And mm -hmm. then they start talking about content and things like that. And I was like, well, wait a minute. You know, isn't really our ultimate goal, you know, in, in order to be able to acquire new clients and customers? And so what you're talking about isn't necessarily getting me there. You know, how, so how can we actually take that step to get to the point where we have customers and we're growing? Right. Um, and I think that's kind of what you, 
said as well, from a marketing perspective and from a marketer's perspective, we can't fall asleep and just do um, the checklist. <laughs> just do what everybody else is doing. There, there is a, a, a seductive nature of relying on technology platforms. And trust me, I love technology platforms. I've been in conversations all week with partner relationship management platforms and the things that they have developed are magnificent. These are wonderful, but there's a limit to what they can do. This is information on demand. There's a certain degree of automation and, and these are good activities. However, that missing link is that reaching out and changing how that field salesperson on the other side of the country thinks about whether they think about you, what they think about, how they communicate that, and how that, as, as your, your point is, how does that translate into actually bringing a sales qualified lead into your system so that my team, who is purely focused on cl moving that into the outbox, right, closing that lead, how does that all happen? And very often it doesn't. Very often we create this magnificent body of work, whether it's content, whether it's marketing materials and co-branded marketing campaigns that people still need to come to, to take advantage of. So partner, you know, that whole partner portal concept, I think is, is, is a, an output of this age and of the technology that's available. However, we do have to go back to first principles and remember that even before the age of technology, before this, this completely ubiquitous online presence. And COVID's had a huge impact on this, hasn't it? I mean, I mean, every, all these relationships have all flattened into these two-dimensional digital interchanges, right? These interfaces. So we have to change human behavior. How do we do that? And that's the rhetorical question we have to keep asking ourselves. And, and we're going to get into that. So we're going to get some insights in the book. And before we do that, I want to ask this question to see, mm -hmm. you know, how is it that you're helping you know, digital marketers be able to solve their problems? Well, there's, I want to, I want to talk about two things. Uh, and one is very conceptual and one is very practical. So the research that we've been doing for the past four plus years now um, is what formed the foundation of unfiltered marketing, the book I co-authored with Paul Einberger. And that's uh, what we call the culture technology intersection study. And, th and th this came from Killing Giants, Once Upon a Time, the book I wrote back in 2011, which was very ethnographic, very story driven. And it was a fascinating process to get into because <clears throat> it gave me an excuse to go talk to, you know, like 80 of the world's most interesting people. I mean, it was, it was a very fascinating process. So if your listeners haven't picked up a copy of Killing Giants, I hope they will because they'll find it fun. Um, however, you know, uh, uh, through that process, we sort of quantified some of the big moving parts from Killing Giants. And that became the culture technology intersection. Study. It's an area of particular interest to me. This has been a sort of a passion project because there is this arms race between technology and behavior, and then behavior is affected by technology. So technology jumps up and takes advantage of new practices and behaviors and expectations, and, and it just symbiotically keeps changing. Um, this body of work is one area where I've you know, been able to get involved with, with some interesting technology companies, some interesting B2B companies who have said, and getting back to our first conversation, how do we better allocate our resources, right? I mean, we're in this age of technological <laughs> immersion <clears throat> and there's this huge, it's this whiteout storm of, of input that's coming into us. So how do we achieve some degree of breakthrough there? So that body of research, whether it's just on its face, let's 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 talk about the implications for a B2B brand. Let's co-sponsor some research and and run your brand through this filter. That's one area where we've been able to help a number of brands sort of see the world in a slightly different way through a different lens. That's one. You know, the other really comes from my personal consulting practice, which is this point of changing behavior, this point of taking an active uh, stance and doing something that is outbound and and changing hearts and minds, which is what we call the AIM program. <clears throat> AIM program stands for Activate, Incentivize, and Monetize. And it, it started um, at, way back when, when a, a client came to me and said, hey, uh, I'm number two and I hate it. 
And I loved it. I mean, it was just the most wonderful encapsulation of, of sort of the, you know, the, the mindset of a real kind of giant killer heart in, in, in a brand. And, and they said, we hate it. Um, our, our field, the mothership's uh, field sales organization, which in their case was the Microsoft uh, uh, field, uh, they're pulling up some leads that we should be involved in. It's shooting over our head to the big giant in our industry. And it frustrates me. How do I get in the conversation? And we built an online platform around that, that, that evangelizes, that teaches. It said, let me teach you how to look at this complex market. You got a lot of things going on here. Let, let, let us be domain experts here. And by doing so, we began to sort of get into the bloodstream and, and we ended up uh, at creating a, a very beautiful platform that's since gone on to be used at at uh, the jobbers and the nuances and the logitechs and the barcos of the world who have, you know, taken that and it's become a lead generation mechanism for them. So, so it is getting into the bloodstream. So one and two, right. It's a left, right combination. We've got a very conceptual uh, uh, research based uh, uh, tool here that helps uh, people in the digital marketing world, but our sleeves are rolled up as you see. And it's very practical and very tactical. And we help them on the AIM program as well. Well, okay. So your AIM, um, we have a similar program at, mm-hmm. uh, at the B2B Digital Marketer and CX Global Media, which is another, another one of our brands. Mm-hmm. That's for smaller enterprises because you mm-hmm. were talking a much larger enterprise. Um, and we call it our RMS system. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you have your AIM, we have our RMS. Yes, but, it's for, but it's more for consultants and coaches and small to medium enterprises and startups. And because they you know, they don't necessarily need some of the, the uh, resources that larger mm-hmm. enterprises need, you know, just because of the way that they're structured and stuff. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm glad you brought it up because yeah, it really it. ultimately comes down yeah. to transformation, right? And, it, and that's the key here. And that's what I loved about the book. Mm-hmm. Um, so in the book, you talk about five rules that came out of all of this research. Yep. And, and you hit on it a little bit in regards to killing giants and the research mm-hmm. that you're doing. And, and, and if you want to add more to the research end of it and how you came out with these five rules, um, I think that would be great. Um, sure. So please go ahead and do that. Sure. Uh, the research um, began in, in 2000. And uh, we looked at the killing giants framework. And we saw three big areas, three big movements. <clears throat> one was what's the future of the brand consumer relationship? That was the big question. You know, the chief marketing officer leans across the table after dinner and pushes the plates away and says, let me ask you a question. What do you know about brand loyalty, about how things have changed? Yes, I know everyone has an opinion. We can all talk about it, but do you have any data? And I was like, you know what? Write that down. Let's study that in detail. Uh, the second was what's the future of the digital footprint how do we pre- present ourselves to the world through digital tools? How do we maintain relationships and communication? And the third, uh, which really came naturally organically out of the consulting work that I was doing was what's the future of work? Um, what is the social dislocation of technology? What is the signal degradation? Every step we take away from an actual face-to-face conversation. And is this something we should be concerned about or something we can embrace, something we can improve, right? One and two and three. So we had these three big areas and in our desire to sort of get our own trend framework launched, we took that as our starting point. And we developed a pretty comprehensive, I mean, that, that covers everything but the future of sleep, right? We got everything from the moment you wake up till the day, the moment you step out of the office, good enough for now. And um, we had no um, bigger agenda than that. Out it goes. <clears throat> we did it in 12 countries the first year. And we saw this data come in very unstructured. Um, and we let the trends bubble up. <laughs> And what we saw was number one, which is maintained, I think, very um, stable over this period of time, has been this first major mega trend, which we call seeking control in an out of control world. And this is critically important. Um, in an age of collapsing trust, others have published on that very extensively. <laughs> Not only are we uh, dissatisfied, with what we see as our digital lives spinning out of our control, 
data being used, uh, um, uh, input being collected without our knowledge. Uh, but we're taking active steps to wrest some sense of control back. And that's what makes it, to me, fascinating. This isn't just a surrender. This is a willingness to fight. And that's, I think, a huge insight. And we saw that bubble up in many different areas. And over the next <clears throat> several years, what we saw was that movement kind of strengthened and came together. And we began to study that in a very dedicated manner. Now, we, we then saw, because of this, we saw a causal link develop over the next few years. We saw the emergence of what th this large trend that we called raw in the absence of trust, where we no longer trust the gatekeepers and the experts uh, who are telling us what to believe. We now trust what we can see ourselves, hear ourselves, and then we trust our own judgment to make our own decisions. What does that mean? Well, <clears throat> it means we want to see the, the live feed. <laughs> we want to see uh, the live stream. I want to see what's going on in the street. I don't need the news cast to tell me. Uh, I want to see the email dump. I want to see the data. I want to see things. My, I, I trust my own judgment at this point. Just show me the truth. So when we looked at RAW over time, we saw not, not only this big uh, sort of macro trend, but we sort of cracked it into three pieces because we saw it moving in different directions. Um, RAW means unscripted. It means as we're doing right here, right? We're having, a, we're, we'll, we'll do it live as Bill O'Reilly so famously said. Um, you know, it's okay to go off script. And we see examples all over the place of CEOs. John Ledger was, was, was famous in his unwillingness to stick to the script. <clears throat> and he described this, he was on stage at a CES show. This is several years back now when, when he was first stepping in as CEO of T-Mobile. I know he's since left. But, uh, you know, someone asked him what he thought about the telecom industry. And he said, in his words, he said, um, and I snapped. And I went off script and my people panicked, but I was up there and he just went into a rant. And that became this new persona for him. And it became an entire new brand positioning for T-Mobile and created that brand. Um, we've seen Ed Bastian of, of Delta Airlines do this with the IT center behind him and uh, during one of their famous IT outages where he had people stranded across the country on Delta flights saying, I don't know what's going on right now, but as you can see, we're working on it. I'll get back to you in an hour. And it's this whole new movement of getting away from the complete buttoned up, you know, professionally produced slick version that increasingly we haven't trusted. Uh, we want to hear it right now. We want to just, just give me the truth and tell me what's true. So that was one, you know, raw means, uh, means unscripted. Uh, raw means in process, you know, this whole idea of, of being in co-development of saying, it's not my job as the brand to do everything privately and then spring it on you. Um, you're part of this process too, Mr. Customer, Ms. Customer. I want you involved. And when we look at how <clears throat> this, this, this sort of co-development philosophy has moved through the industry, um, we see customers, we, we see actual end users, the public responding to this, saying, we prefer this to the big unveil as if we're all sort of out there, you know, in the audience, we want to be behind the velvet rope. We want to be treated as if we are exclusive and that we're members. So that was a second sort of minor theme within, within raw. And, and the last one was sort of in context. And this is critically important for B2B marketers to understand because here, what we're saying is it is no longer our job to be the hero as the brand. It's not us telling you what to think. That's what's being rejected in the world. What they're asking us to do is to get down off the stage and stand next to them and say, look, let's look at this together. Let me teach you how to interpret what you're looking at. That's different. That's different than me telling you what to think. It's like, I can give you some help in interpreting this data. 
And if we can do that, we're now seen as more credible and more believable, particularly in this jaded age. Uh, so that that's this big concept of raw. The last one that we talked about in the book, <clears throat> uh, we called heroic credibility. And, and this needs its own hour. <laughs> uh, it's a huge topic, but in short, we're willing to believe and we're willing to follow along. So, um, uh, however, in order to do so, we have to be willing to uh, take a stand. We have to be willing to be something more than just the sum of our speeds and feeds. But there's a big asterisk here. And, and, and this, is, this is the landmine that's, that, that is in front of us on this path. We have to have credibility in what we're talking about. Uh, if we do, then we're, we're, we're in a, a position to gather, to garner much more brand loyalty and credibility um, than our peers. If we don't, however, we're going to get torn to shreds out there in the world. This is critically important when, as so many uh, brands at this red hot second, think they have to make a stand, think they have to make a statement on <clears throat> whatever social or political issue is, is, is happening in the world right now. Um, what we have found is that when we look at our data set, when we look at the thousands of interviews that we conducted in the, in the United States alone and said, I think brands should uh, take a stand on potentially controversial um, social <laughs> or political issues. <clears throat> um, what we see is the market dividing. And we see, uh, we do have people politically self identified. And what we see are people on the edges, strongly liberal, strongly conservative, becoming much more strident in their opinions, much more willing to uh, uh, support brands that align with their um, personal beliefs or boycott those that don't. <clears throat> However, in the middle, <laughs> we see this growing gap. Biggest single group of Americans right now are moderates and independents, and they're tuning out. And this is the point. You know, for anyone who wants to get into that game with their brand on their back, right? They want to have their brand make a statement about whatever it is we're talking about. Um, you need to do so on purpose. You cannot wander into this arena and think you're going to survive. You need to do your research. You need to do your homework. Nike did their homework. I, I don't personally didn't enjoy the way they went about doing it, but they did it. That's my personal opinion, but they did their homework. So I have to applaud them for it. They took a controversial stand. They were willing to alienate certain people because they knew their core customers would love them more than their non-core customers would dismiss them. That's doing it on purpose. Not every brand's done that. So heroic credibility comes with a lot of caveats, comes with a lot of, of asterisks at the end that brands need to comprehend. However, they do need to comprehend them. They do need to take it seriously. Well, I, I mean, th there's a whole lot of, you know, depth that goes into it. And many of us can just discount what you're saying. Um, and just to reiterate, it's probably a good thing to do it. And before I do that, I just want to let everybody know who's, who's watching or listening is uh, Stephen is recovering from COVID not too long ago and just got vaccinated. And so he's, he's uh, having a, a I should issues. have had a flashing sign up on the screen every <laughs> time I was struggling. So I apologize for that. I'm, and, hey, I'm doing my best to hold it together here, but COVID takes no prisoners. It does not. And so that is unfiltered. And, you know, Very. But, we, but we want to be transparent and, and uh, wish him the best uh, and thank, thank him, you know, for being part of this interview because these insights are so important. But I want to recap these five rules. OK, so it's seeking control in an out of control world. Raw yep. means unscripted. Raw means in process. Raw means in context and then heroic credibility. Those are the five. And, yes, right. Now, and, and you talk in context of these as there being a switch or a flip. So many of us are familiar with B2B you know, B to C, but you, you, you talk about C to B. Can you explain that a little bit? Yes. Th I mean, for our discussion today, this is one of the most central points we can make in this age of technological immersion where uh, truly uh, we are uh, up to our eyeballs and in incoming messages. Everyone's got a smartphone in their pocket. 
we need to acknowledge that the customer here owns the brand relationship. We are interacting with them on their terms. And that's what's so critical because, you know, I, and, and again, a, a lot of your listeners are going to say, yes, well, of course, but of course doesn't always translate back to the office, back to the way the company actually does business, right? Um, once we make this acknowledgement that the customer owns the brand relationship, it does in fact change how we do everything. We have to put ourselves in that role of being kind of second fiddle. We're, we're no longer on stage dictating down to our audience. We're down there with them. And sometimes they're talking to each other about us. So C2B is, is one of those filters we have to drop in front of us here. And that's why things like raw are so important. It explains why seeking control in an out-of-control world is a macro trend. Because they're talking to each other more than they're talking straight back to us. You know, when you say that, I often kind of joke because people will bring out some things associated with, um, they always bring up the Henry Ford quote, you know, people can buy any car they want or color a car they want as long as it's black, right? But, but for me, back in context of that time, mm -hmm. that was still taking a stand. So if there's other companies out there that are generating and creating automobiles that do have, does, you know, do have different colors, guess what? There was a price associated with that. Right. Yeah. Um, and so a Ford was still taking and, and really giving his customers, his loyal customers, what they were asking for. So mm -hmm. what we have to do is roll that forward, you know, into today's world and look for those same opportunities um, mm -hmm. or, or am I way off base on that? I don't know. No, I mean, I, I think this is the point. I mean, here we are living in this world where we can find the brand we want. There is no shortage. Uh, look at the apparel industry today. It's funny, you know, Nike is the biggest uh, brand in, in apparel worldwide. And you know what their market share is? 2.7%. So 2.7%, and they're the biggest. Uh, the the direct-to-consumer movement of brands that have popped up out of nowhere with an idea, with a technology, with a take, uh, whether it's for the mass market, whether it's for a specific niche, um, this now becomes a great test tube for what C2B really means. Do you want uh, Nike on your, on your, uh, on, on your t-shirt? You can get it. Do you want something other than Nike? Are you against a big logo? Uh, then you can do that too. There's no shortage out there that have features and benefits and technologies baked into them. This becomes the very, you know, the veritable definition of, me as a consumer sitting here, I can pull up my phone and uh, you want far infrared radiation like the Tom Brady to TB12 uh, uh, re recovery pajamas that Under Armour sells. That's fine. You can get that. You can also get it from 15 other companies now that you've never heard of. So there you, there, there, there you have it. Yeah, we have to acknowledge that, that it's not just coming down from one source now. And with barriers dropping as they have <clears throat> in launching a company launching a brand, uh, the technology's out there to do whatever you want. So we need to acknowledge this. C customers have more choice than they've ever had before. And it's going to continue to expand. I mean, uh, for no me, question. I'm talking about macro trends and mat macro numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, I was looking at the, uh, the data from the U.S. government talking about you know, filings and registrations for new businesses. Mm -hmm. And it's at all-time record highs. Yeah, I'm not surprised. It's just amazing. Uh, and then also on the flip side, you start looking at um, what is currently a, a problem uh, with especially the U.S. economy. When you start talking about small businesses and the amount of people that they employ, mm -hmm. there, is a, there is a massive, I'm talking millions of small businesses out there that the people who own those businesses are over 65 and 70 years old mm -hmm. and have nobody to leave those businesses to. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when we say the economy, you know, um, and what happened with COVID, that it shuttered a lot of businesses, you ain't seen nothing yet unless we yeah. start really capturing, you know, those businesses, you know, and doing something with them in regards to how that's going to affect, you know, employment just in, just in the U.S. Yeah. So there's a lot of macro shifts that are occurring on an ongoing basis. But for me, the when I started looking at the, you know, the unfiltered marketing, started looking at this data and what you were talking about in regards to, you know, trends and foreseeable future and, you know, us having these choices, consumers having choices, them choosing their tribe. You use the tr word tribe. 
yeah. you know, you talk about intention and attention. I mean, it, it does go back to some fundamentals, I think. Mm -hmm. really. I think so too. Yeah. I mean, I think, again, we talk about C to B as this lens we need to drop in front of us here. Um, and, you know, when we think of potential futures, when we think of, you know, what comes next, there is a scenario planning mindset that we have to have. We've just lived through it the last 12 months. We've seen a scenario planner's I'm going to say nightmare come true, but there's, there, there's an entire group of scenario planners out there in the world who are, who are sitting back there in their home offices saying, I told you, I told you it was on slide 25. And we said, what happens if a pandemic hits? And you all said, yeah, pandemic. Well, and that's, and so right now we're sitting here recording this and, and I think uh -huh. um, earlier in the week or, or, or last week, you know, Bill and Melinda Gates, you know, yeah. Annette publicly announced that they were divorcing. You know, and I saw a clip of her saying how for years we've been talking to people about the pandemic issue. Um, and, and it's true. They were. Um, and so there, there's a lot of these things that are, you know, currently out there in regards to where we're going that many of us just don't listen to. So and I think you bring, you know, bringing up this point is so important because as marketers, we can't just let it happen. We have to actually take this data and we have to be in front of it, because if we don't, then we'll be behind our competition and we'll be that number two, maybe not even number two, it'll be number three, four, or 10. Yeah. Well, there, 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 there's a big upside and a big downside here. And the big upside is truthfully, you know, the reason I'm attracted to big macro trend research and, and applying it to business challenges is because every breakthrough that's ever happened happened because someone got there before everybody else. They anticipated where the public was going and they got there first <clears throat> and they had a compelling sticky message and things worked out. I'm not, I'm not dismissing fast followers. I'm not dismissing all the good things that happened, but someone had to get there first in order for a big trend to become a real, uh, a reality. Now on the other side of the coin, there is that, uh, the, the, uh, uh, scenario planners lament, we'll call it, you know, back on page 25, I told you this could happen and you dismissed it. We didn't put enough resources behind it. Here we are in B2B marketing. I was talking to a, a senior executive, uh, Tuesday of this week at a major technology company. And he said, you know what, uh, we're having trouble right now for, you know, with our supply chain because, the automotive companies are buying up all the chipsets <clears throat> that we rely on. And they, these guys are in the consumer electronics, but they're, they're in the technology sector. And it's like, it's not just a question of, hey, a pandemic is coming. We need masks. You need to secure your supply chains. What happens when there's a disruption on the other continent over here and you rely on them? So there's, there's a ripple effect that goes through this. I'm a huge believer in scenario planning. I'm a huge believer in, in both the upside and the downside here. So as a B2B marketer, I mean, th these are things we need to focus on. These are things I know there's the here and the now and there's the inbox and there's an upcoming staff meeting and a board meeting. And I know there's a customer coming in. You have to be able to do this or you're going to get T-boned the way the entire U.S. economy was when COVID swept ashore. Yeah, it's it's now it's the harsh reality that we have an experience that we've been yeah. through to say, oh, I, I I see. Yeah, I mean, what happens now? You know, you, you look at the way the world has reacted to COVID. Let's just focus on the the B two B industry and and life in 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 sort of a corporate setting. It doesn't have to be big corporate; it can be small business. Um, we threw all our employees home, reflexively, instantly. So. Every laptop manufacturer in the world, every headset manufacturer in the world sold everything they had because you had to be there now. Why? Because of a pandemic, because of, because of <laughs> what's been causing me to struggle through this interview. And I do apologize to your listeners. I, I'm doing my best. <clears throat> but what happens when the next shoe drops? Okay, we're all using home networks communicate back to our servers in the office. We're moving everything to the cloud. We used to be pretty dependent on technology. Now we're purely dependent on technology. What happens, what happens with technology outage? 
what happens with the malware version of COVID-19? And when that happens and what, what happens then? So what redundant systems, what redundant processes do we have to go through? Uh, talking to workspace designers about this, you know, the big architects who, who are talking about ah, the post COVID workplace, you know, we got to touch every office in the world all of a sudden make some adjustment. What's the adjustment going to be though? Well, Everyone's doing, you know, video collaboration, video collaboration, using Zoom, using Teams. <laughs> and so we're going to have huddle rooms over here to use these technologies. It's like, wait a second. What if we don't want to huddle anymore? What happens now? I mean, what happens when you look at, at that, that person to society pandemic lens and then you apply it to the person to technology or person to culture, company culture, <laughs> person to person. These things are all interrelated. So this is a long digression from your simple question up front about what are those potential futures going to look like? I think that every B2B marketer needs to take a long, sober look at what can go wrong. So, you know, that well, kind of planning is well, necessary. What it does well, it, it is. And, and what it does, it reinforces us uh, and the use of data. Uh, and oftentimes we fail to do that. Um, there was, you know, some message that I had seen. Um, I think it was an advertisement for some particular product talking about a conversation, text conversation with a boss. Yep. And they were asking about the performance of a marketing campaign. Mm -hmm. And and they were saying how it wasn't really converting for them. However, they just launched it and we're going to wait and see what happens before they make any changes. And then the boss yep. replies back via text message and says, well, did we test this scenario? And the marketer responded back and said, no, we were under a tight um, you know, release date and we just had to um, go ahead and, and, and release it. Yep. And so then the boss replied back with three fire messages. Um, and then the marketer replied back and said, what, are we waiting to see if it's on fire? And the boss replied back, says, no, you're fired. <laughs> Always marketing's fault. I swear to God, I, story of our lives. Anyway, well, yeah, okay. I mean, so, it's, it's all true. Well, so we have to make changes, right? We have to iterate, we have to transform, we have to, you know, and it can't be micro movements when we're addressing macro issues. And that's what I oftentimes I see a lot of B2B marketers doing um, is they'll make slight adjustments to try to adjust to a macro uh, macro um, um, shift. So if I'm looking at what I'm doing right now, you can think about it from a budget perspective and from mm -hmm. a practice perspective. You kind of hit this in a little bit, but we've had yep. a lot of discussion. So I want to kind of you know, conclude this. Sure. Is to say, what should I be doing right now as a B2B digital marketer if I am reallocating, because I only have so many resources, mm -hmm. time, money, and, and whatever that. What should I be reallocating and what should I be focusing and shifting towards? And maybe what should I be dumping? Yeah, I know, I know there's several questions in there, but I'm sure um, you have a great answer for. Um, well, I've got all. an answer for it. And, and again, I want to throw up a, a quick caveat here. I'm a consultant and I've been a consultant for a while now. And I work with, with B2B brands on specific elements of what they do. You may get a different answer from someone who's actually in the saddle running a B2B marketing team. And I would, I would love to hear their perspective as well. I, I speak to many of them, but what I would pull back to is, you know, again, reemphasize this point of we are now living in a C2B world. The customer is, is, is in charge of this brand relationship. <clears throat> Therefore we have to look at how we can bolster that relationship and how we can protect it. Uh, yes, I started this conversation off saying change behaviors, and I, I still think this is true. I think we have to change behaviors out there specifically as we relate to our channel partners, our resellers, our indirect sellers, and things like that. As it relates to our customer, our end user here, um, yeah, it, 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 it is about reducing friction. It is about helping that rehumanizing that relationship to a degree as much as we possibly can look at for example i'll give you two really good examples one's godaddy 
Uh, I don't know if you're a GoDaddy customer. I don't know if any of your listeners are GoDaddy customers. Chances are about 75% of them are. <clears throat> if they're in that, uh, uh, you know, responsible at all for domain registration and, and all the tools that go around it, their customer service is first class. It's unbeatable how good they are. And their ability to completely reduce the fear, the friction, the, the, the normal antipathy people have for contacting a company saying, I have a problem, is pretty legendary. Now I go back and think about Microsoft. When I first started dealing with Microsoft, when was that? I, it was so many years ago, I can't even remember. <clears throat> they were awful. They would ask for a credit card if you had a question. And... And I thought, you know, this is, this is a catastrophe. And then suddenly I had to contact them a couple of years ago and they had shifted 180 degrees and they were very GoDaddy like in their willingness to sit through me, my own IT department, you know, not exactly the, the future I had originally anticipated, but here we are. <clears throat> and they walked me through migrating through different software changes and updates and things that, that, that I, in retrospect, appreciated greatly. So where am I going to put my money at this point? All things being equal, yes, of course, there are things we have to do. There are technology platforms that are going to allow us to scale faster. These are things we need to adjust to. The technology stack needs to be in place in its most minimalistic fashion, because you can spend all your money there, but reducing friction, increasing customer experience, boosting customer service. If we're in a C2B world and the user is going to find us when they need us, they're going to, they're going to pick up this device and they're going to find us the second they require us, we must be there and we must be beautiful and complete and frictionless. If we can do that, I think we're going to win a disproportionate amount of the jump balls that come our way. That's true. And in, in the, I think you kind of hit on this. I mean, and as far as being able to do that size does not matter. That is part of you being a giant, a giant killer, mm -hmm. uh, disrupting and, and being differentiated and yep. being raw. Yeah. Steve and Danny, I've had a great time uh, chatting with you today. Um, now, before we go, um, if you could, please share with the B2B digital marketing gang how they can get in touch with you. Easiest way to, I'm easily found, truthfully. <clears throat> if, if I want to fall back onto the same talk track I've been on for this past half hour, 40 minutes or so, uh, you can Google me easily and you will find me. But uh, stephendenny.com will, will arrive directly at my doorstep. And, uh, you know, there's resources there. There's interviews I've done through the Killing Giants time frame. And, uh, and you can drop into my resources tab and, and read some pretty interesting people's thoughts on the subject. But uh, I've enjoyed it very much. I appreciate you inviting me on. And again, I apologize for my still recovering state. This was as raw as it gets to stay on brand. Uh, but uh, I hope I was, uh, I hope it was intelligible and useful to your, to your, uh, your, your listeners. So thank you. Most definitely. And we, we appreciate you sharing your knowledge and wisdom and wish you a speedy recovery. Thank you, sir. I'm getting there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Go now to join the B2B DM gang in the B2B Marketer LinkedIn group, where you can connect with other B2B DM disruptors and get access to our B2B DM cheat sheets, checklist, and guides. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, please help by going to iTunes to rate, review, and subscribe. And share the show on all of your digital platforms. Be sure to tune in next week for our next episode. And always remember, you can automate your lead capture, but you must lure your lead.